Hello everyone, welcome to Out of Spec Guide. I'm Max, joined by my colleague Ryan filming me today. And I wanna to talk about a very important topic for 2024, we're seeing evolve that if you click on this video, you're probably interested in. The possibility to charge non-Tesla vehicles on Tesla superchargers because of ongoing partnerships and Tesla opening up its network. It's very exciting because it'll help you avoid stations like this, Electrify America, and similar third-party charging stations, which we've seen just have poor reliability and generally poor experiences. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There's a lot of interoperability, compatibility issues that we have personally witnessed with various EVs in the market. So in this video, I'm gonna tell you what to look out for, why many vehicles, even if they can charge on Tesla superchargers, aren't gonna have a Tesla charging experience. And then I'm gonna tell you, if you don't have an EV yet, what some of the best non-Tesla EVs are that should have some of the best compatibility and experiences on the Tesla network. So let's get into it. So Tesla superchargers have probably the best reputation for reliability and charging experiences. And a lot of this is not just down to the design of the chargers themselves, it's the fact that those chargers are very closely integrated with the design of the vehicles. And we've seen this with cases like my colleague Ryan's personal Tesla Model 3. So Ryan, your Model 3 has not only obviously an ideal charge port location, the charge port is hidden under this uh, tail lamp here, but it also has software. So when you navigate to somewhere, let's say hundreds of miles away, your Tesla is gonna automatically add stops. It's going to tell you if stations ahead of you are gonna be full. Maybe you can reroute to other stations. There's a lot of really dynamic smarts going on between the vehicle and the charging network and communication there uh, between that makes that possible, right, Ryan? That's right, and I don't think that should be too much of a surprise considering Tesla also owns the charging network. But regardless, there's really great integration between the two. Great preconditioning for the battery, so every time I plug into a charger, I'm getting peak charging speeds. Yeah. And it just really knows exactly what to do, and the payment process couldn't be easier. I yeah. simply plug in and it starts charging, that's it. It's the dream. And there have been some different promises, Ryan. So the first partner for the uh, Tesla charging opening up has actually been Ford. So if you own a Mach-E or a Lightning, supposedly Jim Farley personally, well, not personally, but Ford is going to mail you an adapter sometime within the next uh, few weeks, really. Uh, and you'll get a free adapter to charge a Tesla superchargers. But Ryan, we've got a really big issue with vehicles like this Lightning, and that is down to, well, First off, the port placement, right? That's right. Not every electric vehicle has the same charging port location as Tesla, and that leads to some problems with interoperability and parking and charging. Yeah, so we can see here in the Lightning, this is not our Lightning, so we're not gonna touch a stranger's car, but it has a front uh, driver's side port, uh, which is not an ideal location, Ryan. This basically means that, let's say, if this gentleman wanted to charge at a Tesla station, they're gonna have to take up at a minimum two spots. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there's a few workarounds. If there's a pull-through spot, they might be able to charge there. And if they have a charger on the very end and they're able to uh, plug in that way, they might be able to have a situation where they're not taking up two chargers, but bare minimum, they're taking up two charging spaces or one of the pull through stalls. So it's not ideal. Yeah, it's going to be frustrating for not just non Tesla owners, but I know a lot of Tesla owners are expressing anxiety and consternation over the fact that superchargers might be overrun by vehicles that are just not efficiently using them. I mean, Ryan, you're a Tesla owner. How do you feel about that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's unfortunate. Uh, on one hand, I mean, it's Tesla's choice to open up the network. And I think it's fair for anyone who has an EV to be able to charge on the network. At the same time, I, I definitely think it'll be frustrating uh, if I can pull into a charger and I see there is an open stall, but I'm not able to use it because yeah. it's occupied. And here's what's complicated, Ryan. That could potentially mess up some of the smarts, right? Where right now your vehicle and theoretically any vehicle can tap into Tesla's API and see for their stations, oh, there's like 12 stalls left. Well the Tesla chargers aren't gonna know there's 12 stalls left if one of those isn't actually plugged into anything, but it's being blocked, let's say, by a Lightning or another vehicle, right? Right, so that's that's certainly a concern that we have. 
Yeah, so hopefully, you know, we'll have to see how this plays out at large scale, but that could really cause some issues. The other big angle I wanna play into this, Ryan, is software. So we mentioned, right, the preconditioning your battery automatically when you navigate to a charging station. So you get the best possible charging speed, adding routes to your trip. Other manufacturers vary hugely with how well they do this. So the ID4 did this pretty terribly. It does it a little bit better for the 2024 model year. Uh, and then the Ford vehicles do this decently, I would say. Some of the best non-Tesla vehicles maybe are vehicles running Android Automotive. So the newest General Motors stuff like the Chevy Equinox, Blazer EV, uh, Polestar 2, Volvo XC40, those kinds of vehicles, right, Ryan? Yeah, those have a pretty good integration and should help with getting a better charging experience. Yeah. So if you're in the position right now where you're not yet invested in an EV and you don't want to wait, because Ryan, there's actually in a few years or in a year or two, supposedly going to be cars that natively have that Tesla charging port, no adapter needed. You'll just be able to plug in the superchargers, right? That'll be really nice. However, it's worth uh, acknowledging that even if they do change it to a native port, uh, the port location may not change. So even if, for example, this F-150 Lightning had a native Tesla charging port, it would still likely take up two charging spots because of where the port is located. Yeah. So hopefully they're going to design around that. I think like next generation vehicle designs that are incorporated around that will hopefully put in the right place. Also, future Tesla superchargers will have longer cables. We have seen this. Uh, there's what they call the version four Tesla superchargers. There are some more accommodations in place for that. But Ryan, if someone wants to get an EV right now, they don't want to wait for the native port placement. Uh, some of the best, most compatible options in the market probably are going to be vehicles like actually the sister vehicle to this in Ford's lineup, the Mach-E. Okay, it's not the most ideal charging port location, but it's going to charge at its full speed on Tesla superchargers. It will be one of the first vehicles with an adapter, uh, and it has decent enough software. I would say also vehicles like the Polestar 2, you can see over there, uh, the Volvo XC40 recharge, um, you know, vehicles like that are going to be decent, or the Subaru Solterra EV behind us uh, shouldn't be too bad, although that also has a port in the front. Then we've got the Nissan Leaf, which is also there. Unfortunately, Nissan Leafs is, you know, a vehicle. We have a lot of them out in the wild. Ryan, those won't be able to charge on Tesla superchargers at all. That's due to incompatibility with its charging standard, and that's just unfortunate. Right, and that's because the Leaf uses what's called CHAdeMO, and that's different from the Tesla port, it's different from the CCS, it's just an entirely different charging standard that is honestly kind of uh, more or less going extinct. Yeah, there is, I mean, for you CHAdeMO apologists out there, yes, there is a successor to it called Chaoji that's used in Asian markets, but the current version in our US market, well, we know where the future is. It is the Tesla North American charging standard, also known as J3400 in its open source form. Uh, but yeah, there's those big compatibility issues. The other big elephant in the room I wanted to address, Ryan, I wish we had a vehicle to display here uh, like an eGMP vehicle from Hyundai or Kia or let's say a Porsche Taycan, those vehicles have batteries that operate under a high voltage, which means that they can, with few, uh, less current, charge at the same speed or with the same current, charge really quickly. That's when you see vehicles that advertise charging speeds of like 200 kilowatts or greater, 10 to 80% in 20 minutes. Like it's no question where technology is heading. But Ryan, Tesla's own vehicles have not until Cybertruck been high voltage and most of their chargers, actually all of their chargers as of us filming this in the US aren't high voltage. So what's the issue with that? Right, so uh, to keep it simple, uh, basically there's different operating voltages for these batteries and Tesla's current hardware is not set up to charge some of those vehicles super well. So certain vehicles like EGMP vehicles, uh, Ionic 5, EV6, uh, GV60, stuff like that has exceptional charging performance, well over 200 kilowatts charging. However, it needs to have really high voltage, which the Tesla superchargers are not able to prov provide. Yep. And for that reason, it's not able to reach those peak charging speeds. Yes. And so we're not even just talking about like, okay, it's a little bit less than peak. Those vehicles, Ryan, that you mentioned can charge ideally at like 240 kilowatts, pretty fast charging speed. That's how you get 10 to 80% in 18 minutes on their size of batteries. On those Tesla, on every existing current Tesla supercharger, because of their method of basically working around it, they can only get about 100 kilowatts, less than half of the speed. So in a weird way, the Ionic 5, right, a vehicle that can at like, let's say, 
if it's working. This Electrify America station charge quicker than a Mustang Mach-E. Um, ideally it can. At a Tesla station, it's actually, it's actually gonna charge slower all down to that kind of interoperability issue. That's right. So it's really important to keep in mind those types of details. Yep. It will change your experience when you're charging on the Tesla supercharger network. Yes. And for those of you who are driving uh, what we charitably call, I guess, compliance cars or older EVs from like 2015, 2016 props to you, like the Volkswagen e-Golf, we have found in our testing that currently at Tesla stations that have a built-in adapter, there's a handful of them around the country, some of those EVs don't charge because there's inner uh, communication issues because they use a very early version of the CCS charging protocol. And so there's basically some communication issues that mean if you have, for instance, a 2016 Volkswagen e-Golf and your name is Kyle Connor, or it isn't, then you're not gonna be able to DC fast charge it. And that's unfortunate. Maybe that could be resolved, but to be honest, Ryan, that feels like, okay, there's only a handful of those vehicles on the road. Uh, there's probably not gonna be too much work done by like Volkswagen or Tesla in that case to make it compatible. Yeah, I think it will be likely a very low priority thing. I don't think there's going to be that many people with those vehicles, even fewer of them trying to do long distance driving where they need a lot of supercharging. So I would not uh, bet on that happening for them. Yeah. The last thing I want to bring up, Ryan, is payment. You mentioned in your Tesla, it's basically as easy as can be. You plug in and it's billed to your Tesla account. This is the promise of how it's going to work on Ford and I believe General Motors vehicles, theoretically, through their app. In Ford's case, through Ford Pass. This is a big unknown, a big TBD. And the reason I say I spell it out loud as a big TBD is because these vehicle manufacturers all have a very mixed track record of actually providing reliable software, over-the-air updates, and payment experiences. This is what Tesla excels at. And I think the fail-safe, Ryan, is either using the Tesla app and going through this, you know, kind of clunky process of charge my non-Tesla, selecting the charge port location, all of that, or having to, I guess, just not use Tesla chargers and use Electrify America. It's gonna be kind of an awkward, clumsy process, I think, for a lot of vehicles uh, to actually pay a Tesla superchargers. I would definitely agree with that. I think the actual user experience of operating and starting the charger, whether or not it's on the Tesla supercharger network, Electrify America, EVgo, I think they're all going to be largely very similar. You're gonna have to open up the app, figure out which charger you're at, activate it on your phone and plug in. It's not the most convenient thing, but also yeah. not the end of the world. Yeah, the elephant in the room, everyone always says this is, why can't these chargers just have card readers? Well, in some cases they do. Some, but not all, Electrify America stations have card readers here. These terminals have been notoriously unreliable for whatever reason, uh, so in many cases, the troubleshooting step they tell you is just use the app. Apparently it's more reliable, but I get it. Not everyone wants to fiddle with an app on your phone, or if you haven't set up like an RFID pass and you don't have cellular connection, you might be SOL because you do need a connectivity to use that app. So it'd be nice to have reliable card readers, but these Electrify America stations, as well as many other stations don't, the Tesla superchargers until now haven't because there's been no need for it. Now, Tesla is seeming to accommodate, uh, Ryan, these are seeming to build in these uh, similar sort of terminals that can read cards to their very newest sites, but there's relatively very few of those. We haven't seen too many V4 sites, but obviously that's the way things are headed. There's actually requirements under NEVI, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure uh, Act, federal funding basically that Tesla can get that requires they need those card readers. So that's great for the future, but that means for so many of these existing stations, you're not gonna have those. Definitely. Any other points, Ryan, you think that are important bringing up in terms of interoperability and what we can expect as Tesla supercharging rolls out to many non-Tesla customers this year? Yeah, I think one thing uh, to keep in mind and I think a realistic expectation is that it's not going to be perfectly smooth. I think there's going to be hiccups. There's probably going to be problems. Uh, I think interoperability and uh, the whole payment problem is a, a serious challenge and It'll be interesting to see how Tesla tackles it. I'm optimistic that they'll be able to do well, but I don't think it's going to go perfectly for everyone from day one. Yeah, the TLDW here is that Tesla cannot single-handedly save charging because up until now, their network has been designed for their vehicles first and foremost. That's part of what has made it work so brilliantly. I'm not you know, opposed to the idea that Tesla can rise to the challenge. They clearly have a great charging team. I'm sure they'll do their best. Hopefully other vehicle manufacturers also do their best, but 
we've got a long ways to go as we've seen from the evidence we currently have. So that's the situation of fast charging uh, non-Teslas in 2024. Please let us know your other questions about using Tesla superchargers, the state of the existing CCS network, and all of those questions and more that you may have. Leave them in the comments, let us know, and give a like and follow, subscribe to Out of Spec Guide to stay tuned to all kinds of uh, getting started content for your electric vehicle. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Bye.